Amen. So I've got a little different sermon for you this morning. So I, you know, one of the challenges for me is how you know, I can stand up here and preach three sermons a week and not completely bore you to death. So how can I, how can I do things differently to keep you at least interested and awake when, I, when I'm preaching, right? So um, I'm going to look at things from a little different angle this morning, okay? And turn to Psalm chapter 139. And, you know, looking at things from a different perspective or even from other people's perspective is a very valuable skill that you could have in your life. Putting your, you know, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and see why people believe things that they believe is a very valuable thing. And if you can get good at that, you will be better at dealing with people in your life, whether it's at work, um, at church, wherever. Um, even when it comes to people with completely opposite opinions than yours, if you can be able to just kind of look at, okay, why, why do they believe that? Where is this thought coming from? Even if it's completely wrong, look at Psalm chapter 139 and look at verse number 1. See, God does this with us, so maybe we should learn um, to do it with other people. Look at Psalm 139 verse 1. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou, knowing, thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all, of my, with all my ways. So God, look, God does this with us. God understands our thoughts. Of course, He's God, but, you know, we should be able to do this with others. We should be able to look at things from another perspective. See why people do things, why people believe things, even if those things are different than the way you do those things. And what it will end up doing is shoring up your own beliefs is what it will end up doing. Examples. Many stories in the Bible, you know, tell us how to do things, right? Especially in the Old Testament. But then there's many stories in the Old Testament that tell us how not to do things. How to, you know, how to not do those things. Once again, stories, you know, remember our methodology of reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament as we're going through Judges. Stories in the Bible are just that. They're stories of what people did. Okay, they must be, in order to take away from those stories, those stories must be properly married with correct Bible doctrine to learn from those stories, whether they be good or bad, right? I mean, Judges has lots of these types of stories. Um, the life of David has both sides, right? David has things where we can learn from David, and then we can also learn how not to do things from the life of David. You know, the point this morning I'm trying to make is... Um, I want to look at something from a different perspective this morning. So my wife, um, a, a few weeks ago, sent me an article. And she sent me an article, and I want to talk about homeschooling this morning. But I want to talk about it from a, a perspective of this article that my wife sent me. So let's not be narrow-minded this morning, okay? Let's open our minds, and let's look at um, this idea that's in this article. Now, normally I wouldn't have read an article like this, but I read the whole thing. I forced myself through it. And this morning, the title of the sermon this morning is Why You Should Not Homeschool. Okay, so we're going to go through and step through this article, and we're going to look at the reasons that this article talks about that you should not homeschool, and then we'll shine the light of the Bible on these reasons. So look, the, the, the title of the article, I'm not going to give out uh, the, the name of the magazine or anything like that. That's not really the point. A lot of these points you may have heard before, but the, the title of the article is The Benefits of Public School Over Homeschooling. Okay, so let's look at this article and, you know, just look at, you know, why you should not homeschool. Let's try to appreciate a different perspective this morning. Open your minds, okay? Open your minds. So first of all, the article starts off, and this is the first sentence, okay? What is homeschooling? In the simplest terms, homeschooling is simply schooling your children at home. Now normally I would have stopped reading the article at this point, because this is clearly written by a halfwit for halfwits, just by the, the, the start out of the article. But in the interest of my wife chiding me and telling me, no, but keep going, it, you know, it gets better. I actually did continue, and then that's where this sermon came from. Okay, so I did continue even though everything inside me was saying, you're done reading here. Okay? All right, so my wife chides me on. I read the article and I write this sermon. So here this morning I want to talk to you about six reasons that you should not homeschool your kids. Okay? The first reason is this. 
I'm going to read you the statements because this, the article was bulleted out with, with statements. So I'm just going to read you a statement. We'll look at the lesson and then we'll see what the Bible has to say. That the first statement in the article, the first bullet point is this. Public school has a built-in structure. Children, particularly young children, thrive on routine and require a lot of attention and care. If you are trying to homeschool, your, if you are trying to homeschool your children while also being a stay-at-home mom, you may find it more challenging than you imagine. Now, I had to read that sentence several times, okay, to understand what, what they were getting at there. Public school gives you and your child some much-needed time apart, which helps to foster your child's independence and gives you a break as well. There is no harm in needing a break from your kids once in a while. <laughs> okay, all right, oh, look, look, stop being so narrow-minded, let's cut this thing up. So the first point is this, the first reason you shouldn't homeschool is because children, let me just break these, these, this opening statement out to you, children require a lot of care. That's the first reason you should not homeschool. Okay, translation, if you homeschool your kids, you'll have to give them your attention and your care. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, this statement, if you're trying to homeschool your children while also being a stay-at-home mom, you may find it more challenging than you imagine. I had to read that one a few times to kind of get myself in this mindset of this person that would write something like that. But this statement is clearly trying to discourage parents from not only just homeschooling, but staying home with their children in the first place. Okay, so there's, you'll see that there's another twist behind each of these statements. It's not only against homeschooling, it is twisting against being a stay-at-home mom altogether. Okay, and most of you can read, you could see through the lines and you read between the lines there. Look at Deuteronomy chip, uh, 6 and verse number 6. The Bible says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, the whole point of the whole chapter is the law of God. The oracles of God and learning the law of God. And teaching that law, look at verse seven, number 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest. Up. Now notice what it says. It says teach them. It doesn't just say teach them the laws. It says teach them diligently. Now if you go to this church, you know what the word diligent means. Diligent means consistency over what? Consistency over time. Gold star. Consistency over time. This right here might be the one verse in the Bible that is the most teaching you that you need to homeschool your kids. Because it is talking to you about that you have to teach the, the laws of God to your children diligently, which means that it has to be consistent and it has to be done over a long period of time. Because look, if you're consistent at anything for a week, you might be, you're consistent for a week, but you're not diligent. Diligence is staying consistent over a long period of time. And the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is saying that's what it takes to teach your children the law of God. You have to teach them diligently. And that takes time. Okay, so look, parent, I mean, th this, this statement really shows you the state of parenting today. This statement in this article. It's hard for me even to remember this sometimes, but, you know, where people are at. But, you know, many moms out there today, they just can't imagine. I remember maybe 15 years ago, a, a woman at work you know, found out that my wife stays home with our children, and she made the statement to me, she made the statement, she's like, oh, I would, because she was a mom. Look, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to be a mom. I mean, it's a physical thing. I mean, you could have a child and be a mom. Okay, so, you know, but everyone thinks that they're just, you know, this great moral mom just because they physically had a child. And this lady said to me when she found out that my wife stayed home with our kids, she said to me, she's like, oh, I just couldn't. I just couldn't do that. I, I don't know what I'd do all day. I don't know what I'd do all day. And I've heard, you know, different versions of this over the years. But here's the thing. Of course you don't know what you would do all day because you don't know what it's like to be a mom, to actually carry out the duties of a mother. You have no clue. Of course you would not know. She's like, I, I don't know what I do because you're not a moral mother. 
You're not a mother that's doing what the Bible says that you should be doing as a mother. So, of course, you wouldn't know. You know because just because you're a mom physically, I mean, look, moms, moms, physical moms today, I mean, it is daycare from the hospital. It is, you know, school. At, you know, they, they don't even call it daycare anymore because calling it school when they're six months old, it makes your conscience feel better. Okay, so then it's to public school. Then after public school, after 12 years of public school, it's off to college. It's, I mean, look, they can't even fathom the idea of spending all day with their children. The, the, the modern day mom. And that's where this comes from. What would, I, what would I do all day? That's why this article is saying, I mean, if you stay home with your kids, I mean, and you, if you homeschool your kids, I mean, yeah, that's going to be even harder than just staying home with them. I'm like, it's, it's from a completely different perspective. They're living on another planet than the planet that you live on. That's how far away this is. But the Bible says differently. The Bible says that you must teach your children diligently. That's your job as the parent. As the parent to do that. It's completely different. So that means you're going to have to spend a lot of time with them to be diligently teaching somebody. Point number two. Here's the second bullet statement. Many public schools offer sports and elective options like art and music. These programs may not be available to homeschool students. Translation point number two is children cannot learn or exercise without public school. I mean, my experience has been exactly the opposite of this, by the way. I mean, first of all, do we have homeschool kids that know anything about music? But look, I mean, homeschooling actually gives you the freedom to do different activities and go on and, and, and do different things. I mean, from hiking to hunting to fishing, I actually have too many activities on the list of things that I would like to do and not enough time to do all those activities. But homeschooling gives you that freedom to take your family to those activities where you're not in this, you know, this box of uh, you know, a, a public school schedule. So look, go ahead, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Laser tag, paintball, I mean, how many more activities do you need? Organized institutional sports, by the way, you know, no thanks. I mean, organized institutional sports that the public school offers, you know what that produces? And look, I, I participated in those organized institutional sports, guilty, okay? And, but look, you know what that produces? On the, on the large scale, it produces adults that are just addicted to watching TV, is what it does. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And it's also not true because of this. Here, I mean, just from a, a legality standpoint, people have no idea, but a homeschool child has just as much right to participate in any, any sport or any activity that the public school has going on. They pay the same taxes. Now, I would never recommend that, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but just, just the facts of the article are completely wrong because you could participate in those things. But look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 11. So, you know... I want to speak to those who do this because we have met people that do this type of thing. They go to the music class at the school. They go to the sports activities at the school. And we did it for ourselves one year for sports. And I'll never recommend it to anybody. You should never do it, and here's why. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 is why. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If we cannot classify the public school system in America as the unfruitful works of darkness, nothing will make that grade. You should have nothing to do with it as a homeschooling parent. And I'm getting off the topic of why you should not homeschool. But when you homeschool your kids, you should have nothing to do with the public school system. You take nothing from those programs. You have nothing to do with them, period. It's works of darkness. You don't need, that you're, you don't need your kids being in that fellowship with those kids that are in that public school system. Look, I've seen it. I've seen it done. It's always bad. It's always bad. Why expose them to any of it? And the Bible's telling you that in Ephesians 5, verse number 11, just stay far away from it. It's another aspect of separation. Stay away from it, period. And the kids there. Look, I hope those kids get saved, and we'll go out and we'll preach the gospel to these kids in their neighborhoods and all that, but I'm not going to just turn my kids over to that situation. Okay? Look, their friends should be here. 
They're, you know, this is where they will receive edification. And this is where they will receive strength for their beliefs. And look, anyone, and here's another thing. Anyone that as you, as you homeschool and as you leave the norm, you leave that status quo and come into a homeschooling environment, you'll have a lot of support here. That's why the importance of a biblical church. You'll have a lot of support here. The kids will grow up together. But here, you remember this. You're not going to put them in public school because they'll disparage what you're doing here. Anyone that ever disparages you leaving that status quo, I have a nuclear button, and, and that's when I push that nuclear button. If anybody has ever pulled my kids aside and tried to teach them something different, try to teach them something different than their beliefs in the Bible, try to you know, disparage homeschooling, nuked. I mean, look, Romans 12 says, live peaceably with all men, but I have, I have zero tolerance in this category. Anybody, you know, look, if you're involved with my family and you're not saved, it's, that doesn't necessarily mean we're never going to talk to you again. But if you start disparaging my kids and their beliefs and try to, you know, disparage them and pull them away from what we're trying to accomplish in their lives, nuked. And you need to be like that too. You need to keep them secure and build their confidence as you teach them diligently. Okay, so the sports thing is, is ridiculous. I mean, that was just a ridiculous one. Uh, point number three. Here's the bullet point. Public school teaches children a certain degree of independence. De <laughs> Depending on the grade, children need to keep track of their own class schedules, find their way from one class to another, purchase their own lunch, and make it to and from the bus every day. I mean, we're dealing with somebody with like below 80 IQ here that wrote this, clearly. I mean, this one's completely false, first of all. I mean, they, they kind of all are, but on the contrary, <laughs> On the contrary, public school teaches kids to be institutionalized. I was, I just told some of the guys, I'm sorry guys, you got to hear this story again. I got a, this was not in the sermon, but I got a call yesterday from, I have my car, my, my Tahoe's at the mechanic. And I got a call from the mechanic, and they've had it for two days, so I figured, you know, it's tires and alignments and ball joints and stuff, and, and I figured it's done. So I didn't even call them back, I just went over to the shop. And they said, we didn't call you to say it was done. We called you because we couldn't get it started. I literally went to the mechanic yesterday to fix my own car. And I was like, what's going on with it? And they said, well, it won't start. And I was like, well, you know, I mean, first thing, you know, is the battery dead? They're like, no, you know, we hooked it up to the, our battery booster thing, and it, it won't start. So I went to the car, and, and I turned the key. And, and the lights came on the dash, and I turned the key to start it, and the, all the lights dimmed out. It was like, the battery's dead. And they're like, no, we hooked it up to the, to the thing, the booster thing, or whatever they call it. And I was like, did you put a meter on it? And they said, what? I was like, go get your meter. And so he went and he got, uh, you know, found a meter in the shop, and I showed him how to work his own meter, and I put it on, and it was four volts. The battery's dead. He's like, do you have a battery? No. I went and I bought a battery, I installed the battery myself at the mechanic shop. And I started the car and I said, what else do you need? <laughs> and I told the shop manager as I was walking out, I said, look, you're not instilling a lot of confidence in me right now. You got it from here? But look, here's the problem, they're institutionalized. When the car doesn't start, you get the blue thing. And you hook it up and then cars start now. What if car no start after that? I don't know, call owner, say car no start. So they call me and, and they just didn't know what to do. And I was, you know, they don't know how the battery works the car. They don't know how to troubleshoot anything. They, but this is, inst this is institutionalized thinking. This is why, you know, these, these good mechanics and these good tradespeople, that's why they're, they're the, these people that are 50, 60 years old that are good at their trades, that's why they're priceless. Because they're not stuck in this box. These, this is what public school does. It institutionalizes people. It teaches you to memorize dates. When did the Spanish Armada be destroyed? This date, this date, this date. So you can pass a test. That's what it does. You don't think about why. You don't think about, hey, how does this fit into the worldview that I'm learning from Deuteronomy chapter 6, God's law? How does this, how does this society and how they went through these cycles and then they eventually fell, how does that compare with the Bible? We're going through Judges. Are we recognizing any patterns in Judges? It's kind of like a history book. We're seeing patterns, right? 
Do those patterns match up to anything that we're seeing going on now? Of course they do, because everything's the same. And when you have the same, when you have the biblical worldview, it all fits together, and you can see the problems coming before they even come. Because of a biblical worldview, you're able to dynamically think and put things together and, and you know, connect dots. And you can figure things out. Public school is teaching kids to memorize dates and pass a test. That's it. And just to get by. It's not teaching you how to think or explore the truth. Garrett just asked me yesterday, like a Bible doctrine question. And I knew how I felt about this Bible doctrine question, but he's like, hey, I think maybe this. Look, I'm not talking about salvation, but it was a complicated Bible doctrine. And I said, well, here's what the Bible says, and here's why people believe this doctrine, because the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 12, look it up, look into it. And if you think that it means that, whatever, and I, you know, think though, think. This is where that doctrine came from. They got it from this verse in the Bible. It connects to this verse, and it connects to this verse. Think it through. Think it through. It's good that people learn and this is homeschooling right here. This is homeschooling, teaching kids to be self-starters in their own education, teaching kids to look into things and to learn how to think about situations, whether it be history or, you know, why, why math? Why math? Because everything works math. That's why. When you pick up a chair and throw it through the wall, that's math. Everything is math. And it's all practical learning dynamic experiences. You're not stuck in some box trying to just memorize something to pass so you don't have to go there again. That's public school. That's what it is. And the examples that they give of independence. They find their way from one class to another, purchase their own lunch, and make it to and from the bus every day. I mean, look, first of all, it sounds silly, but this one's particularly evil because they're telling parents in this article that all these things, basically, it's, it's in a subtle way in this sentence, but it's, you're teaching, the, they're telling you that these things that a child should rely on their parents for, it's good that they're not relying on you. Yeah, yeah. You know, feeding, you know, they can get their own lunch. Hey, you don't have to feed them. They'll get their own food. It's like training them to be, you know, wild animals or whatever. But to fend for themselves is, an, you know, teaching kids to fend for themselves, a, you know, aside from their parents is a major theme in the article. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. It gives it that tinge of evil, the article. Ephesians chapter 6. So it's good for kids to be able to go around by themselves and find their way to and from things by themselves when they're 6 and 7 and 8 and not have to rely on, you know, mom or a parent or something to take care of them and feed them. It's good for them to know that stuff. It's good for them to get used to being away from their parents as much as possible. That's what this article is saying. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. What does the Bible say? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what nurture means? Nurture means to help something grow, develop, or succeed. That's what the word means. I mean, to help something. So we're supposed to be diligently teaching and then nurturing, helping someone grow and succeed and mature. I mean, that means, I mean, that goes right along with diligently teaching. It's, it's right there with it. Look at, now here, look at the previous three verses. I mean, this is talking about the raising of children. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So look, it's te teaching kids here obedience, and then it's teaching parents to nurture their children. So in order to be obedient, look, these two people are together. The child and the parents are together here. And it's saying since you're going to be together over time, you need to be obedient and you need to be nurturing. I mean, it's clearly teaching that, I mean, look, the Bible talks about, when it talks about children, you always hear things like, like train them. Proverbs 22. You hear things like, bring them up in Ephesians 5. You hear things like, teach them diligently. You see things in Mark 9 like, receive them. You don't see, send them off. Get rid of them. Let them go on their own. You, look, that, that's what men do. That's what adults do. That's what you know, adults are supposed to grow up in, in, in the Lord. But never with children. Children are to be protected and taught 
and nurtured and, you know, brought up. That's the kind of words that the Bible always uses when it's teaching parents and children relationships. And children are supposed to be obedient. I mean, how could my child be obedient to me if he was never there? There would be no need for that. If somebody else was to raise my, chi raise my children, it would say, children, be obedient to the government or whatever. It's nothing about, it had, the Bible has nothing about sending them away to fend for themselves anywhere. Amen. Jesus himself was super protective of children. And if you don't get that by reading through the New Testament, and, I mean, that is a huge theme. Anytime anybody said anything negative or even pushing children away, Jesus was like, no. Like, no, we must receive them. We must protect them, teach them, train them, bring them up. Point number four. Here's the, here's the sentence, or the bullet point. Teachers, are, teachers, are pub, teachers at public schools are required to carry education degrees, and they may have more experience working with and teaching children. Teaching a child is different from parenting a child, and many parents struggle to do both. Again, so the point is this, teaching a, teaching a child is different than parenting a child. I disagree, completely. Totally. Again, they're injecting doubt in your ability to raise your own children. But look, parenting is teaching and is training. That's the point. It's not just hanging out, having Nerf Wars. That's not parenting. I mean, look, I like Nerf Wars. But I mean, otherwise, even to, look, even to understand this one, you need some perspective. The modern parent I mean, the modern parent goes to work, they drop their kids off at daycare all day long, they pick their child up, they come home, and by the time they, you know, go get food from a restaurant or whatever and put their kid in front of the TV, because the kid's watching four or five hours of TV a day too, that's what the stats say. So there's like an hour in here before the child goes to bed. And the modern parent, and I've seen this maybe a billion times, but the modern parent just wants that hour to just be good. They just want it to be good and without struggle and without strife. So there's no parenting going on there. It's just make them happy. That's what it is. But look, uh, go, to, um, go to Matthew chapter 22 to get ready for the next point. But look, it's fun time for the modern parent. It's cover your conscience time because their conscience bothers them, especially at the beginning. Okay, so look, there is no... So yes, to the modern parent... Teaching is not parenting. Parenting is not teaching. But to the Bible, parenting is teaching and training. That is the point of parenting. That is the point of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Is don't forget these laws. And teach them. So look, not only do you not forget them, but we don't want the next generation to forget them. So you must be diligent in this task. You must be diligent. You may, must just continue and continue and continue every day in this task. So, I mean, it's just completely wrong. Parent, I mean, they just don't even know what parenting is. It's, it's back to the same definition of being a mom. Being a mom is just not, you know, being a proper biblical mom is more than just physically having a child. There's a lot to go into parenting. I hope that, you know, sermons over the last year and a half kind of makes you a little bit nervous about parenting. Am I doing it right? I mean, there's a lot to this. Yes, there is a lot to it. You can get it wrong. There are a lot of people working against you. That's why you must have the nuke button. When you see people creeping into your, you know, your safe circle and trying to harm what you're doing or undo what you're trying to do, you must fix it as the parent. Dad, you must be the protector in those situations. This is parenting, and it is a big deal, and it is teaching. Amen. Are you in Matthew chapter 22? Here's the next statement. Public school is typically cheaper than homeschool. <laughs> you could spend $1,000 or more on a homeschool curriculum alone, not to mention supplies. For a public school, you have to buy supplies once or twice a year, and you can pack your child's lunch to save money. Okay, so before I go off on this one, I just want to give you a biblical disclaimer in Matthew chapter 22, okay? I'm not a tax protester, but I'm thinking maybe I should become one. No, I'm just kidding. 
I'm not a tax protester. Look at Matthew chapter 22. This is what Jesus thinks about taxes. Verse 17. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? They're trying to catch Jesus, and they're trying to get him in trouble with the Romans. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose, Im whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. So look, I'm not a tax protester, neither was Jesus. He's just like, let them have their stupid money. Okay? But first of all, before I address this statement, so we got that out of the way, before I address this statement that public school is cheaper than homeschooling, look, this, this clearly shows you that someone who went to public school wrote this article. I mean, it's clearly written by, like I said at the beginning, it's clearly written by someone who does not understand things, including basic math. California spends $11,500 per child on school every single year. Let's just look at the numbers. California public school system, it's almost $12,000 per child. We spend, I mean, I'll just give you examples of what we spend. I asked my wife uh, this, and here's the thing. If you reuse a whole bunch of books that you use because, I mean, why would you just throw everything away? That's not efficient. That's not, that doesn't make sense. If you reuse books, my wife said if we bought new books for every child, which I don't know why you would do that, it'd be about $500 a year per child. But if you reuse books, it, she spends about $200 a year per child. And look, we buy some nice curriculums. You can buy used books. You don't have to buy everything new. I mean, 200 versus, I mean, let's just round up to 500. Let's get gold-plated books, brand new everything. $500 a child versus $12,000 a child. Public school is cheaper than, than homeschooling? I mean, what in the world? I mean, look, and here's the funny thing. It's even worse than that because, well, I have to pay for all my homeschooling materials. I still pay thousands of dollars a year in taxes that go to the public school system. So I am literally paying, I am literally paying so the government can mess up my neighbor's kids. I mean, it's criminal. I mean, it's criminal. Public school is cheaper is an idiotic statement made by someone who is brainwashed by communism. That's what that is. They're brainwashed by, look, look, here's the thing, nothing is free. Nothing is free, oh, because all you have to do is buy some pencils and everything's free. Nothing's free, communist. That's the problem. That's the problem with this country is the public school system has turned everyone into a communist. Where they think, every, look, somebody has to pay for all this. Somebody has to pay for all this in the annals of America. When it's somebody in a new republic somewhere, if this isn't the end, okay? If someone in a new republic, when they're writing the annals of the American Republic, you know what they will find? They will find that, look, they'll find that America fell to communism. It is the root of everything. It is the root of every problem. You, see, you think of a problem. Communism is the root in this country. With all of its problems that we have, from the immorality, to the perversion, to the abortion. It's communism is the, is the root of it all. Turn to Proverbs chapter 11. And public school, the public school system will, be, will go down as the greatest tool used by the communists. Because they taught communism to all the kids. You say, well, they don't say they believe in communism. I don't care. If you think that it's all free, you're a communist. You may not think you are, but you are. I mean, it's pretty good if they can teach you a philosophy and you don't even know you've been taught that philosophy. You're a stupid communist. I mean, look, it was this tool that was the messenger. It was this tool of the public school system that was the deliverer of the false message, of the immorality, of the, of the secular humanism worldview, of the perversion. It was this tool that has properly just injected all this garbage into our society. Look at Proverbs 11. And in this case, a false balance. Look at Proverbs 11.1. 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Look, if you think everything's free, and you think that everything's just paid for, everything should be paid for, that's a false balance. Because nothing's free. 
That this money that comes from nowhere is a false balance. And it's an abomination to the Lord. The, the idea that we can financially break you through tyranny and shutting you down and all this, and then we can steal money from your grandchildren and give it to you and you'll be happy? You're a communist. I mean, it, you're a public school protege. Public school made it all possible. I mean, this is maddening. This is maddening. Should we stop? Let's keep going. Now this one's old. This one's so used up, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to even read it, but we're going to go. Here's the second one. Probably the, the stupidest and most tired of all arguments against homeschooling, right here. Bullet point. Children who attend public school have more opportunities for social interaction than many homeschool students. There are homeschool co-ops that can be helpful, but a public school has built-in social benefits. <sighs> Sorry. Yes, they're still claiming this one. Okay, but look, here's the thing that's so shocking about the, that, the idea that they're still claiming this one is that we have like an entire generation now after, you know, homeschooling started in the 80s where you were kind of a pariah if you homeschooled and then in the 90s more people did it. Now, look, it's not just the, it's not just the Christians homeschooling now. Everybody's homeschooling now. I don't know what the numbers are now, but I mean, homeschooling's exploded in the last just few years, especially this year. But as we see the results of public school kids who are now adults, and we see what kind of social skills that these, these adults now have. You know, you have a, you have a 40 year old foul mouthed punk. I mean, that's from the public school system. He was socialized at public school. I mean, is that, look, is that, I mean, are, are these kids, you, you ever met the public school kids and they speak to you like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's on your shoes? Why do you like your shoes so much? Look at me. They won't shake anyone's hand. They'll never look you in the eye. It's just, they get behind a keyboard and they're all, ooh, yeah. They're tough. But they meet you in person. They're staring at their shoes. Look, this is antisocial behavior. This is called antisocial behavior. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. What is social behavior, though? Let's look at what social behavior is. Well, the Bible tells us. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 29. Look at verse number 29 of Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Okay, but why? That which is good, but. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but instead, that which is good to the use of edifying. Assuming that, you know, it's, it's basically inferring that this corrupt communication is not, edifi is not edifying anybody. Because right. it's corrupt communication. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. But look, not only we're told, you know, to, to edify means to instruct, improve morally or intellectually. Okay? When you're raised to speak like a rapper, you're not edifying anybody. When you talk like, you know, a hip-hop artist, that's not edifying. When you use, you know, street slang, that's, not, that's corrupt communication. You're like, okay, you know, I use street slang, but I don't swear because I'm Christian. But here, let me just give you a little bit of a, a heads up here. If you speak like that, people think you're stupid. People think you're dumb. You sound like an idiot. I don't care if you just pull the, the swear words out. Or, or you use the non-swear swear words. Now you're just a coward. I mean, look, this corrupt communication, I mean, people would just think that you're a fool. That, that, that's what it will. I mean, if you speak like a gangster. That's what's coming out of the, that's the socialization that I'm seeing. And I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it with adults. I'm seeing it with middle-aged people. You get to about 50 plus, you don't see it. But you're in the, in the 40s and down, my generation and down, and, and you see it. You see an adult talking like some 17-year-old high school, public school punk. And that guy's going nowhere. That guy's going nowhere. 
and it doesn't it doesn't take it doesn't take a a, a Bible believing Christian to listen to that guy and just be like, I don't know why, but that guy sounds like a moron. Yeah. You know, everyone just knows. Like, oh yeah, that guy's a moron. That's the social skills. It's corrupt communication. It's corrupt communication. So, I mean, look, the most, the best socialized kids, and here's the beauty of homeschooling, by the way. Homeschooling, and that's another thing about public school, this wasn't even in my notes, but public school, it trains kids to only interact with their own age. Right. You know that? They, they can't function. They, they well, well, you're two grades down. Oh, you're a grade up. Uh. They don't know. You see, homeschool kids in a homeschooling group, in a homeschooling environment, you will see 10-year-olds to 19-year-olds playing a game together successfully. They're socializing successfully. And, you know, I mean, we'll hear the kids talking, you know, about the games and things like that. And sometimes you've got to tune up the little ones. You've got to tune them up. And you've got to be like, hey, you know, you want to sit down and you want to play with the 17-year-olds. You want to play that game. You better just be quiet and pay attention. And don't act like you're six. Instead, if you're 10, act like you're 14 in those situations. They, it trains them to mature. And it trains them to be able to also protect and take care of younger kids and relate to kids of all different ages. Which, by the way, men, the men that go to work, is everyone the same age at your work? Amazing how that transfers into real life skills. Amazing. So look, I mean, socialization is, homeschooling is way better for socialization. I've never understood this one from the beginning. And I mean, I'm sure that there's those homeschool kids that are off, you know, somewhere and never see anybody, but there's weirdos everywhere. So what's the point, you know? Conclusion, there's your six points right there. But here's the concluding statement of the article. The concluding statement is this. In addition to the benefits lifted, lift, listed above, there are some downsides to public school. Whoa, okay, we wanna be well-rounded in this article. There are some downsides to public school. For example, public school has a more rigorous and regimented schedule than most homeschool programs, and students may not have the same degree of freedom and flexibility to customize their education. This is like, you ever gotten asked that question in an interview? What are some of your weaknesses? And you say, well, Bob, I just work too hard. That's my weakness. <laughs> Tell me one of your weaknesses. Well, I'm too dedicated. <laughs> Where you turn your weakness into a strength. You know, you flip it around on the interviewer like that. You know, I mean, this is what the interview classes will teach you, right? This is what they're doing here. The downside to public school is that it's more rig regimented and, and, uh, and rigorous education, right? The downside of public school is it's better. <laughs> Basically what they're saying. So, like, it's so stupid. My main weakness, Bob, is I work too hard. It's, and look, and it ends with this. But unless you can fully commit yourself to creating and implementing a strong homeschool curriculum, your child may be better off in public school anyway. So it em ends with a simple scare tactic once again, right? That, that unless you know, you're fully committing yourself, they'd probably just be better off in public school. So they scare you, and then they give you the out of public school right here. Look, the article had an overall theme of intimidating the mom that was thinking about staying home. That was what was really wicked to me about the article, is that the mom that, is, that is, has that conscience that's bugging them after they you know, have their first child or whatever, because look, I mean, you still have a conscience. I mean, if you're not a reprobate, you have a conscience. I mean, every mom that has a child and then goes to work, has a, that, their conscience bothers them about that. I mean, they get better at it and better at it and better at it as time goes on, but look, they have a conscience. I mean, they're basically, Everyone knows the public school is bad. That's what I see with normal, decent people. They don't have to be saved. Everyone knows the public school is bad. That's been my experience with normal people. The problem is, is that the men are weak, the men in the families are weak, and the women are scared. And this article is preying on that fear that women have. You know, the, the, the mom, homeschool mom. I mean, it's intimidating. It's intimidating, can I do it right? Can I, you know, it seems, it seems so hard, right? How could, I, how could I teach my kids when I wasn't even really good at school? Maybe you weren't good at school. Guess, I wasn't good at school either. I hated school. I mean, just, that means nothing, by the way. But look, 
the, the, the mom sits there and she's like, how could I do that? But guess what? Here's the beauty of homeschool. You start with the alphabet. Do you know the alphabet? You start with learning, teaching them how to read and phonics and things. And guess what? Maybe you learn with them the whole way. Maybe you relearn everything the whole way. All you have to do is stay one step ahead of your three-year-old. Pretty sure you can do that. And the thing is, you know, the beauty of a church like this is we'll help you with that. The idea here is that we're going we're gonna to support you. We're going to show you. You know, we'll show you and teach you the, the schedule. And my wife will show you curriculum options and activities. And we'll keep those social activities going. Look, my main focus and my wife's, our main focus, one of our, our visions and our main goals for this ministry, especially as we go independent, is to have a strong homeschooling core here where we can support that. And we support the, the families that are maybe just getting into it or continuing to homeschool or whatever, that we can bring this thing together and, and, and give your children a, a great organized curriculum and schedule, socialization, the whole thing. Amen. That's, one of, that's, that's one of my main goals, my wife's main goals, when we think about the purpose of a ministry. Amen. It... it it's one of the main things. But look, here's the thing. This sentence that the, the thing said, you might just be better off with them in public school. Let me say this, mom, who's worried about this. If you're an unorganized mess, your kids are still better off. They're still better off. Because they, they will mess up your kids there. They will... They will undo everything biblical you are trying to do because guess what? You know what they are? They're diligent. They have all day, every day with your kids. They will mess them up. They will put in the wrong worldview into them. They will inject them with all kinds of perversion and, and just, just weird thoughts and things and, and beliefs about everything, they will literally turn your kids upside down morally. Turn to Isaiah chapter 5. The point of this sermon, and I hope you saw that with every single point we went through, the point of this sermon is in Isaiah chapter 5, and look at verse number 20. Every single point of that article, every single point that they were making for public school against homeschooling was the exact opposite of the truth. It wasn't not a little bit true, or maybe they were twisting this. It was the opposite of what you believe. It was the opposite about what the Bible teaches. Look at Isaiah 5.20. The Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You're like, man, who could mistake darkness for light? That's exactly what this art article was. It was just calling darkness light. They will call evil good and good evil. It's happening. Look, just not being in that situation, in that system, is a win. And then from there, then we build from there. You know, proper homeschooling. You know, proper biblical education for your children. You know, music, sports. I love sports. Activities. It's all, it's all a bonus. But look, it's, 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 now here's, here's the plug. It's why you must be involved in a good church. It's why you must raise your children amongst like-minded believers. It's essential for the next generation's success. I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well knock it out of the park. That's what I think. Might as well do it right. Look, I'm against public school. I'm even against sending your kids to college. But I am for world-class education. I'm for higher education. I'm for continued education. Look, get outside this box that this culture has put you in. I don't know where those guys yesterday learned about starting a car. But they, it's, they're in the box. They're in the box. We have to get outside the box that this culture has put us in. That's what homeschooling is all about. Homeschooling is about getting outside that box, separating from it, and just learning the, 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 the real good. And, and not what they're calling good. Because what they're calling good is evil. 
And that's what this article is all about. So there's six reasons you shouldn't homeschool. And there's so much more. But there's so many reasons to homeschool, but mainly because the Bible just tells us it's necessary. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.